Hello and welcome to another adventure on this planet Earth. I'm Mark Gilchrist and this week we're going to Northern Thailand to find some inspiration from 12 young football players and their assistant coach. If they can survive 17 days trapped in a cave, maybe we can all survive this viral madness. It was an ordinary summer, 2018. It was an ordinary day, June 23rd, in this ordinary city, Misai, Thailand, when the Wild Boar football team went on an ordinary trip to celebrate one of their birthdays. That ordinary trip would invoke an extraordinary search and rescue operation that would captivate the world for weeks and draw thousands of volunteers from 23 countries. There have been many excellent videos made about the Tam Long Cave Rescue, and I've listed some of them below. I came to the city to tell this story again and to interview some of the boys. Well, those interviews are not to be. I'll explain later. But I still would like to tell this story. Why? It can be pretty inspiring for us right now. The boys uh, lived in villages right around here. There's a web of roads, dirt roads and paved, that go for miles up and down the mountains. And the boys just rode their bicycles into the park. Outside the, the main exhibit hall is one of the largest exhibits. It shows a map of the area uh, with all the chambers about where certain things were found by rescuers as they were on their way to the boys. And then the final chamber, I believe the 13th, where the boys were found. Before entering the cave, the boys parked their bicycles along this railing. And they were the first things that searchers found. Two new exhibit halls have been built to show the dramatic rescue and the story of the wild boar football team. Thousands of people will visit these caves every year, mainly due to this tragic mistake that turned into an international story. Three of the boys are stateless. That means they have no country. Uh, their heritage is from a region around here that belongs to several different countries. And so none of the countries give them a passport. Now life around here depends on the weather a lot. It, n it never snows, but, <laughs> but it rains. And there is a rainy season. And the rainy season was about to begin. In fact, they just got in the rain the night before and the cave system is closed during the rainy season and it was about to close. So this was the wild boar's last chance for the season to go down and explore the caves. The team's coach, Naparat Kantawong, looked at his phone around seven o'clock and discovered he had a lot of missed calls. Well, he returned the calls and found out that the, none of the boys had returned. Now around seven o'clock here, even in June, it's getting dark. Mr. Naparat was getting nervous. He rushed over to the caves and he found at the entrance all their bicycles chained to the railing. Now Coach knew these caves and he knew these boys knew the caves. He knew they weren't lost. He knew they weren't fooling around and he knew it had rained the night before. Coach knew these boys were trapped. That discovery, that revelation at that moment lit a fuse not just in the city, but around the world. Within days, the area was filled with volunteers from several countries. Day after day, they searched. No boys. The world was growing weary of the search. It had been well more than a week and with nothing. And the odds of finding those boys was getting slimmer and slimmer. But then July 2nd, and British divers Richard Stanton and, and John Bolenthorn found the boys. I can't imagine what was going through their minds when they came up out of that water. They said they smelled the boys first, and then they saw them, and then they counted them. All there. 
And this is where the where the boys, where the wild boar football team studied. And many of them still do here. I tried to get an interview maybe with some teachers or with the boys, but you know, as much as the world saw this as an extraordinary event, the Thai are not so excited. Uh, two people died. They don't want to celebrate it. They don't want to dig it up. They would not like me to interview any of the students or even teachers. And that's, uh, that's just fine. So the boys had been found. Some would say that was the easy part. Now they had to be rescued. Their location was four kilometers inside the cave and a good five or six hours journey. As water levels receded and the team got practice, they would get that down to three or four hours. But still, a long way to go and a lot of underwater for 12 boys and a coach who were not scuba divers. Heavy rains in early July postponed the rescue for at least a day. And on July 5th, former Thai SEAL Sanan Kunan died. And then rains were forecast beginning July 8th. And people knew they had to act and act now. Divers knew that at any moment, the boys could become their own worst enemy. They could panic and easily destroy any chance of their survival. So the divers decided that the best way to get them out of there was for an anesthesiologist to sedate them. Each boy was given a full face mask and wrapped up tightly in a bundle that divers called the package. They were pushed and pulled and led and dragged and carried through four kilometers. How did the boys decide who would go first? Well, they made a decision, one that illustrates just how isolated they were, not only in the cave, but well before this incident, their entire lives. They decided that the boys who would go first would be the ones who lived the farthest away from the caves because they would have to ride their bicycles home. They had no idea that the world was waiting outside for them. That 13 ambulances were sitting there waiting to take them to the hospitals. As the boys were brought out one by one, nobody on the outside was told of their identities. This so that no mother had to worry any more than any other about whether her son was still in the cave until the very end when they announced that all of the boys had been rescued. So how can we gain inspiration from these boys? Well, let me set the scene. They were lost deep inside a cave. Their future was dark. And when I say dark, I mean two, three miles inside a cave, 3,000 feet under the mountain, no air, no light, phone batteries dead, 13 people alone, trapped, no future, dark. The big question I had, I wanted to ask these kids, was how did you keep it together emotionally? 13 different personalities holding on to so little. 13 different people could have gotten on each other's nerves. One just has to credit their coach, the only adult in the, in the room. He must have tirelessly kept this group encouraged. Many people blame the coach for getting them lost in the first place. But you know, that cave was still open. In fact, the mothers made it a point, as soon as those boys were found, to handwrite notes, give them to the divers, for the coach. What did the notes say? They thanked him for saving their children. What inspiration can we gain from the mothers? It's best to forgive rather than just sit there and complain and try and rewrite the past. What can we learn from these divers and rescuers from 19 countries who all work together toward a common goal? That 
How can we be inspired by this community? Well, naturally, they all came together. People donated food and necessities to the families of the 13 boys and the coach who were holding vigil outside the cave and couldn't work. Schools donated money. Children made 1,000 origami paper cranes, a Buddhist tradition for good luck. And finally, what can we learn from Tam Luang Caves? Well, there's a lot of things about nature that we just do not have control over. Remember the three boys and the assistant coach who were stateless? Well, that September, the king made them citizens of Thailand. Well, thanks for hanging. I hope you enjoyed my latest adventure. I'm Mark Gilchrist, and I am, and you are, we all are, on this planet Earth.